Hi, fellow seekers, heretics, and guildmates. Welcome back to Idea Sex, where we take an analytical lens to mysticism and spirituality. My name is Kiara, the Mad Witch, and today we're going to be talking about remote viewing, uh, the evidence for remote viewing as I've come to understand it through. <laughs> what a weird bookmark. <laughs> I don't know why it was in there. <laughs> Uh, the Reality of ESP by Russell Targ. In the last video, we talked about how there are several classes of experiments that have reached the Six Sigma threshold. And basically, that means very high levels of confidence. So in the world of science, Five Sigma is like the gold standard, and Six Sigma equals very high levels of confidence. Um, see the last video for more, but suffice to say, Five Sigma is like Beyonce levels of confidence. Six Sigma is like RuPaul levels of confidence. So very confident. That being said, Six Sigma can still, of course, be wrong, and especially when it comes to things like psychic phenomena, which are still fringe despite the overwhelming amount of evidence. Um, you know, scientists look at this stuff that's not supposed to exist, and they're like, no, 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 there must be an error in like the way the experiments are done or um, the way that the data is analyzed, whatever the case. Again, not here to convince non-believers. I just think that this is so interesting and should be uh, discussed more openly and also like just more widely known about. So. In his book, The Reality of ESP, Russell Targ writes that the evidence for ESP, um, for psychic abilities, is so strong that it would be logically or probabilistically unreasonable to deny the supported argument. On the basis of the evidence presented in the book, it would be unreasonable, in my opinion, to deny the existence of some kind of human ability to experience distant events. For context, Russell Targ is a laser physicist. He was an award-winning laser physicist who went on to found the Stanford Research Institute's remote viewing program. And that program is the one the CIA contracted with in order to launch Project Stargate. And Project Stargate was a $20 million, 20-year program um, that was run by the government investigating psychic abilities for military applications. It's wild stuff. We'll get to that another day, but um, today we're going to be talking about the concept of remote viewing and the evidence that Russell Targ provides in this book, some of his interesting studies. Remote viewing was a term coined by Ingo Swan, and he was the linchpin. He was the psychic, the legendary psychic who was the linchpin of Project Stargate. So Ingo Swan, uh, Pat Price, Hal Puthoff, Puthoff? I don't know how to say his name. I've only ever read it. And Russell Targ are the early pioneers of remote viewing. Ingo Swan, Pat Price, they're psychics, and Hal and Russell are scientists. Uh, Ingo is going to get his own video on this channel in the near future. So if you're interested in learning about a modern Merlin, do subscribe because we'll be going into depth about him in another video. Um, but suffice to say, the dude is kind of a legend. He told us that um, he told us about the Jovian ring system before scientists even knew that Jupiter had rings, and he did it through a form of clairvoyance called remote viewing. Clairvoyance means clear seeing, and it is a form of extrasensory percep per perception. <laughs> I turned into Sean Connery there. Extrasensory perception, uh, or ESP, also referred to as extended human capacities or psychic abilities. There's a lot of words that mean the same thing here, and it's in part because we don't have a standardized vocabulary for these things yet. Like it's not well understood or well accepted enough that um, there's reason for us to all be using the same words, but it's also in scientific communities, there's some apprehension around using words like psychic because uh, I think psychic has different connotations to different people. And, you know, some people hear that and they think of like scams and frauds and um, fortune tellers and hocus pocus. So. ESP. Clairvoyance is a form of ESP, and it specifically relates to seeing. So clear seeing, clairvoyant, and um, it can, it, it's sort of an umbrella term that encompasses different things. So we can divide it into primarily two kinds of clairvoyance, where you have external clairvoyance and internal clairvoyance. And external clairvoyance is less common. Um, some people will have this very strongly as children, where they are able to see and perceive energies or spirits, and they actually see it in the physical world, like with their eyes. Think of like how augmented reality looks to us, right? Like when you put a headset on and there's an overlay. So that's external clairvoyance, um, is being able to perceive things uh, that other people are. And internal clairvoyance is something that is done on your viewing screen. So also called the third eye, the witch eye, the mind's eye, whatever you want to call it. It's what we see when we close our eyes and imagine something. So when I tell you to imagine a snowman suntanning at the beach, 
that thing that you see, that image that comes up, it comes up on your viewing screen and that's internal clairvoyance. So remote viewing is a kind of internal clairvoyance. The idea behind remote viewing is that we can use that internal viewing screen to see events that transcend time and space. And this is not a new concept. It's actually been around for a very long time. The ancestors were very familiar with this ability. Um, a number of anthropologists who have studied with primitive people have uh, seen this at work in like actual tribes. And, and one thing I've read about is how remote viewing was used by shaman to locate um, like, like herds, for example, for hunting or to keep an eye out for enemy threats. And so they were a really key part of keeping their community safe and they did it through this ability. Uh, eighth century Buddhists were familiar with this practice as a meditative skill that involves moving from conditioned awareness to naked awareness. So it's been around for a while. And like a lot of the things we talk about on this channel, it's like the, the mystics and uh, the ancestors and the ancients all knew about it. And now science is kind of sort of starting to catch up. And it's going to be really interesting when these things converge. So here's an example of how remote viewing might work. Um, you, get, you give the remote viewer coordinates to anywhere in the world, someplace they have no way of knowing. And this is called the target. The remote viewer gets into a state of deep relaxation focuses on the target and sketches what comes into their mind in a sort of stream of consciousness way. Uh, they may also, after that, use words to list their impressions of the target, what it feels like, what it sounds like, what emotions it instills. And sometimes there will be an interviewer who facilitates the information by asking the remote viewer questions. But introducing words is where remote viewing can get tricky because of what Ingo called analytical overlay. And it's related to a concept we've talked about a lot on this channel, which is the idea of the egoic mind. Uh, and we won't go into depth with that here, you can check out this video if you want more information, but the egoic mind or left brain consciousness is our linguistic center and it um, loves to tell stories. And so it will latch onto a detail and it will tell stories and think it knows the whole story based off of a detail. And so an example of how this plays out in remote viewing is say someone's remote viewing and they perceive something that's red and fuzzy and they're like red and fuzzy. And then their egoic mind goes, it must be Clifford but it's not Clifford, it's actually a red velvet ant. It's a scary wasp. Their brain caught on to, or their, when they were remote viewing, they catch on to the detail of red and fuzzy, but their egoic mind runs away with that and is like, it's red and fuzzy, it must be Clifford. It could be nothing else. In the book, Mr. Russell uh, describes this as mental noise. Mental noise is the ongoing chatter in our minds together with the desire to name and concretize everything we see or experience. The great psychic Ingo Swan calls this noise analytical overlay or AOL and says it comprises memory, imagination, and analysis, all of which we use to color and reconfigure our sights and experiences. The idea is that we give everything we experience all the meaning it has for us. Our assumption is that the outer world has no meaning inherent to itself. This illusion is what Buddhist, Buddhists call maya or samsara, and it does cause a lot of unnecessary suffering, which is when how we've often talked about the ego on this channel. But in terms of remote viewing, it's just one of the barriers that people face in trying to access accurate information that transcends time and space. You know when you sit down to meditate and you are trying to clear your mind, but all you can hear is that constant, annoying internal narrative. And you're like replaying parts of your day. You're coming up with comebacks for arguments that happened like five years ago. You're imagining elaborate orgies. You're going over your to-do list for the day. All of that is the ego, right? And that, that voice is going on all the time. But if you're like me, you never notice it until you pick up meditation and then you're always aware of it and it's annoying. Um, suffice to say, the left brain, that ego, can work in tandem with the right brain, with the intuitive mind, but it has control issues. Uh, that's the short version of it. And so what often happens is people will get an impression of a distant target and our brain runs away and starts telling stories about it rather than coming from that place uh, that the Buddhists call naked awareness. And if you've ever meditated and tried to keep your mind blank, you know how hard it is to stay in a state of naked awareness. It's very freaking hard. However, for people who can do it, they end up doing crazy like this. So the top is the this person, this remote viewer's sketch of the secret base that he did not know existed. Um, and he did this just based off of geographical coordinates. And then the bottom is an actual picture of 
the base. These are a couple of remote viewing sketches from Joe McMonagle, who was an army officer at the time. And this was in the 70s, right, when TARD took remote viewing to the American army. The bottom is the photograph of the base, and the top is a sketch from Joe's remote viewing of this base he didn't know existed, right? He was just given its geographical coordinates. Side note, Joe now works at the Monroe Institute, which we have talked about before. And uh, you'll notice if you come back for idea sex often that a lot of these people and ideas end up connecting. But this is wild, isn't it? What if, what if this was scalable and repeatable and measurable? According to the people involved in these projects, it totally is. Together with HAL, Russell started doing controlled experiments on remote viewing in 1972. And at first they were sort of small and boring. They brought Ingo in and they had him uh, determine whether a, a laser hidden in a box was turned on or off, or they would have him describe images in an envelope. And so Ingo was very bored. He was like, he did really well on the test, but he's like, if you don't give me something more interesting to do, I'm going to nope the heck out of here and go back to painting. He was also a very uh, gifted artist, which I think makes sense for someone who was so visual, he could see everything. Um, and so Hal was like, okay, buddy, let's make this more interesting. And he gets geographical, geographical coordinates from a contact at the CIA. And Hal and Russell had connections to the CIA because of the work they had done uh, with lasers, which we won't get into in this video, but they were already sort of known to the CIA, which is part of the reason that I think later the CIA starts to go along with their work because these people had a lot of credibility in their field. But he gets these coordinates from his friend at the CIA. And uh, this is the beginning of Project Scanate, where Ingo believed that he would be able to remote view anything in the world based off of geographical coordinates alone. This is wild. By the way, Scanate stands for Scanning by Coordinates. I don't know how you get Scanate out of that. I think it's an awful acronym like AOL. They're just bad at acronyms, but the rest of this book is really good. So we'll go into depth about all the controlled experiments that Ingo Swan did in the Ingo video, but just to share one here, they've been doing this work for a while with Project Scanate and, and seeing how accurate Ingo could be. And <laughs> there was one CIA contact in particular who was very dubious. He was convinced that Ingo had memorized the globe. That's the only way that he could be doing this. And so he sent coordinates for a secret base that the Russians were using as like a meteorological, me meteorological, how do you say that word? That meteorological station, there you go. A random ass island, there you go, a random ass island in the South Indian Ocean. And uh, it took them two years to confirm the details because it was a secret base, but this is the result. And so the top is the base, the island, and the bottom is Ingo's uh, interpretation of what he saw. And it, it took them a few years, like I said, two years to confirm the airstrip, um, which I don't even think is on, on the map at the time, uh, because, you know, it was it was hush hush secret base thing. So this is what Ingo drew within minutes of receiving the coordinates. It's quite similar. It's quite similar, especially like the location of the mountain and the airstrip. Those are pretty exact, but this could have been coordinates to anywhere in the world. He could have given coordinates for Disneyland and he gave him some remote ass island. And so the accuracy is pretty phenomenal. As a result of trials like that, Ingo and Russell and the people involved, they went on to teach a lot of the people in the army how to do this. And the people who were taught by them are a lot of the people who run remote viewing uh, like courses and retreats today. If you're interested in learning remote viewing, because one of the things too that they set out to prove is that this is a, a pretty natural ability to a lot of people and that um, some of their most psychic people actually were just apparent, like for all intents and purposes seem like normal, army people um, who ended up having really uh, extraordinary hits is what they call it when you when you gauge something accurately. So if you're interested in learning this kind of stuff, I highly recommend you check out the Reddit forums. I think that books and scientific papers are great for learning like the theory and the science and like of validating whether or not it's real. But if you wanna learn about the direct experience, um, definitely check out the forums on these things because it's fascinating, first of all, people's stories, but also on Reddit in particular. When I still have this book on my head, I forgot it was there. In Reddit in particular, um, they'll give you geographical coordinates that you can, just like Project Scanate, or you can test your remote viewing abilities. So uh, just giggles, you know. The other interesting thing to note about these experiments, especially the ones done with Pat Price and Ingo Swan, were that they it appeared they transcended not just space, 
but time. And we've talked about that theoretically in that video, but uh, here's a concrete example. Pat Price, AKA the psychic policeman, uh, who's gonna have his own video soon. I'm working on that one too. If you've watched this far, you should subscribe. Pat Price was put in an electrically shielded Faraday cage with uh, Russell Targ, who acted as the interviewer. And then their target, who was a, th um, a third person, would go out into the city and he would hang out somewhere for like 15, 20 minutes. And Pat Price was supposed to describe his location. These nine trials were formally evaluated by Dr. Arthur Hastings, an experienced judge of semantic content who was a psychology professor, uh, not part of the SRI team, and is now dean of the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology in Palo Alto. He was given all nine of Price's transcripts with his drawings if there were any. Hastings then went on uh, to each of the target locations and ranked the transcripts from one for the best match to nine uh, for the worst match. For example, if Hastings were standing at a boat dock full of little boats, he would give Price a one for the transcript where Price is talking about a boat dock with little boats, etc. Hastings had no information other than Price's narrative and the transcripts that could lead him to match them to the correct targets. But because of Price's very detailed descriptions, Hastings was not a difficult task. He was thus able to make a correspondence in a blind fashion for all of the transcripts, judging seven of the nine of them as a one in terms of matching. Moreover, Price had specifically named the boat docks that Baylands Nature Preserve, the Hoover Tower, on the campus of Stanford University. The chances of even identifying the seven out of nine is uh, three in a hundred thousand. So that's pretty wild. But what's even more wild is this. I should mention that Pat had actually viewed and described the Redwood City Marina a half hour before the travelers were anywhere near that watery destination, which was 15 miles north of the SRI on San Francisco Bay. So of course, it's no surprise that the government started to take an interest in these things, especially because, like I said, Hal and uh, Russell already had connections to the CIA. They were already well known for their work as laser physicists, and they had a lot of credibility. So when these two hella smart dudes start talking about ESP, uh, they listened. And then they did experiments for 20 years, and they're probably still doing them. When all of this work was declassified by the CIA, and I think, I think it was 1995, uh, it was analyzed by the renowned professor of statistics at UC Davis named Jessica Utz, and she had this to say, the SRI data is stronger. The SRI data is stronger than the FDA experimental evidence showing that aspirin prevents heart attacks. Uh, I'm sorry, what? That gives me literal goosebumps. So either aspirin uh, is really unreliable when it comes to preventing heart attacks or, or remote viewing is very, very real. To conclude, this is an amazing, amazing read. 11 out of 10 recommends. Uh, and I'm curious, I would love to have idea sex with you in the comments. Do you believe in this shit? If so, why? If not, why? No judgment. I'm just genuinely curious what other people make of this kind of information. And if you enjoyed this video, do subscribe and join the guild. I'm going to be putting out a few other videos on this topic specifically over the next few weeks. And then we're going to go into some, some other things, I believe. But in any case, thank you so much for joining me on Idea Sex today. Thanks for having Idea Sex with me. And until next time, stay blessed from their work as laser physicists, physicists, dude, dude, between, dude, dude, dude. <laughs> uh, words are so hard. Can't we just use telepathy? F words. I don't want a word anymore. Let's just use telepathy.